Let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can uh, come together tonight for this uh, course on John's Gospel. And we do pray that, uh, you would, uh, that we would be able to come to this with eager hearts, that we would uh, long to know Jesus better, that we would be strengthened in our faith, that we'd be equipped for ministry. And we pray that you'd be helping me to teach faithfully and clearly from your word today. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, we're into our second week on, on John's Gospel. And uh, the plan for tonight, as you can, you can see on my notes there, is uh, we're going to try and look at the I am statements uh, to begin with. Then we'll look at John chapters 11 to 21, just in overview form. And uh, uh, we'll try and just think a little bit about what uh, is said about the, the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, as as well so a topic to begin and end and then we'll complete the uh the overview of john's gospel in the middle so let's uh let's dive right in then and and think about uh the i am statements what are some of the i am statements that you can remember in john's gospel i am, I am the way <laughs> <laughs> yes I am the good shepherd. I am the gate of life. I am the good shepherd. <laughs> yes. Any more? I am the, the bread of life. life. Yeah. I am the vine and the branch. <laughs> yes, I am the vine. I am yeah. the light. <laughs> the light of the world. Yeah. Any more? I'm the life and resurrection. Resurrection and life. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> I think you've got I think you've got them all. Uh, so the I am statements are, are, are very uh, significant in John's gospel. They're obviously one of the, uh, you know, the features of, of John's gospel that, that kind of makes it unique. And uh, they're interesting because of two things. Right? They're interesting because they are statements of, um, that emphasize Jesus' divinity. But they're also interesting because they are Jesus' own self-descriptions of, of himself um, used by him to help us to understand his identity and his, his mission. So if we're going to understand them, we need to do so in the light of the Old Testament, because that phrase, I am, is a very loaded term as we think about the Old Testament. And there are really two uh, key uh, Old Testament backgrounds that are crucial to understanding the I am statements, right? And the first one is from Exodus chapter three, verses 13 and 14. And uh, this is where uh, God reveals his name, right? Yahweh, uh, which means I am who I am, right? It, it's a name that is uh, very closely related to the Hebrew word for to be, or I am, right? So we see in Exodus three, verse 13, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is your name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now, of course, this phrase here is a little bit hard to understand, uh, to translate, is it? Does it mean I am who I am like it is here? Or does it mean I will be who I will be? As in, is it emphasizing God's self-existence and his unchangeability? Or is it emphasizing that uh, God will be known from his, from his future acts? I think it's ambiguous and it's probably picking up both of those things. Um, God is unchanging um, and God, God will reveal himself and his future acts uh, in, in the Exodus. Um, so, it's impossible to not have this illusion in your heads as you see Jesus say, I am, and associate himself with the divine name. Also just notice here the, the capital, the small caps here. Um, whenever you see Lord in small caps in the Old Testament, that's the divine name. That's the name Yahweh, right? The, the Jews never used to want to say God's name out loud, and so they would just 
substitute the, the, instead of saying Yahweh, they would just say uh, Adonai, which means Lord. And uh, and so in our English Bibles, we maintain that whenever the divine name is there, it'll be in Lord in all all capital letters, right? So the other the other key kind of background is from the book of of Isaiah, and and again you see this this uh, phrase I am comes up quite regularly there. Uh, emphasizing that God alone is God. So let's pick up verse 10. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no saviour. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I and not some foreign gods among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days, I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand when I act. Who can reverse it? So you see how God is using this uh, phrase, I am, quite regularly uh, through these verses. And it's probably an allusion back to to Exodus 3, and God saying, look, I'm, I am the only true God. There's no other gods apart, apart from me. And so, again, it's really significant when Jesus says, I am, because he's, he's now associating himself with the one true God who says that there are no other gods apart from him. But Jesus says, well, I am, I, I am him. I am uh, divine. Uh, and then one more example, Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more, right? So we keep that background in mind as we come uh, to the I am statements. Now, there are actually two types of I am statements uh, in the book of John. Uh, and the first, uh, you know, a lot of those I am statements is one where it doesn't have an attribute following it, right? So that is, Jesus just says, I am, a bit like we've seen in those, uh, um, those Old Testament passages. Then there'll be a second round where, uh, of passages where Jesus says, I am, and then he adds some attribute to describe, to describe himself. But let's take the first batch first, the ones that don't have the attributes. And uh, given the Old Testament background, for Jesus to just say, I am, with no qualification or no attribute following it, it's impossible to not see that as a claim uh, to divinity, right? So let's, uh, let's have a look at a few examples uh, here. Maybe we can just uh, go around and uh, we'll have uh, one person read each each one. So let's start with Terry and then you can nominate the next person after you, okay? Okay. John 4, 25 to 26. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I'll choose Brother Santos. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was I am. Okay, Brother Lemuel, Pastor Lemuel. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. May I choose to Pastor Moses? Then just knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. They said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let this man go. Right. Thank, thanks for reading those. Now, you can notice in our English translations there how, how this is uh, translated. They often add this extra word here, he, I am he. Um, but literally, it's just ego amy, I am, right? We, they're just adding that word in for kind of good, in, you know, good English, right? So this first one here, uh, it could be Jesus saying, uh, you know, I am the Messiah. It's at least saying that, isn't it? She's saying, look, I know the Messiah is coming. And Jesus says, oh, well, I, I am he, I am the Messiah. But it's literally Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, I am, right? And 
so it has that double connotation to it. It's impossible to not hear um, that allusion back to the Old Testament. Uh, similarly for this one, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. It's impossible not to see that as a claim to divinity. And you see, in fact, what, what happens immediately after uh, Jesus says this uh, statement in John 8, uh, verse 59, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. So they can see very clearly that Jesus is claiming to be divine. He's, to be before Abraham means to be, you know, in, it's, it's an, a claim to you know, pre-existence or to be, to be eternal. And, and they understand that, which is why they pick up the stones to, to you know, to uh, kill him for, on the charge of blasphemy. Uh, chapter 13, verse 19, I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Again, it's like, a bit like the first one. Um, you know, it could be just Jesus attributing a title to himself, but it seems to, to, to also have more, more than that behind it as well, right? that, that, that he has the divine name. And then this last one, this is really interesting, isn't it? This is where they're arresting Jesus. And... You know, uh, Jesus, they answered, they asked him, who do you see? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am. <laughs> and when he says that, John tells us they all, they all fall to the ground. And, you know, what's going on here? Is it, is it that they, they're falling down before him in worship? Um, because um, are they falling down before him in terror? Um, and it, it certainly seems to be the case, again, in this passage, that it's emphasizing jesus a divinity so that's the first set of i am statements that we have the second lot, lot we have is the i am statements that are followed by uh, an attribute if you like a, a statement of jesus self-identity uh so uh i am the bread of life or i am the living bread some of these are repeated in slightly different ways i am the light of the world i'm the door of the sheep i'm the good shepherd i'm the resurrection of the life I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine, or, I, or just I am the vine. If you count them, how many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, it's probably not accidental that there are seven, seven I am statements. I think we are meant to group them in this way. I don't think we should say that there's nine here. Um, there seems to be seven of these statements. Remember, seven is the number of, uh, of, of completion, uh, perfection so you know in the book of revelation uh you know what's the what's the number of the of, of the antichrist and so on at 666 because number seven represents god there's lots of sevens in the book of of revelation you've got the seven spirits of god you've got the seven churches you've got the seven you've always got seven 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 all the way through the number of perfection completion surely this is even just the fact that there are seven of them is uh, emphasizing that uh, you know Jesus is is fully divine. Now, of course, each of these I am statements, we 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 want to be understanding them in the light of uh, their their context, right? It's not that Jesus just kind of uh, you know randomly throws out this uh, this statement, but it's it's to be understood in the light of uh, of what he's been doing in terms of. The sign, and remember that's how John's gospel is put together. We have the sign, and then we have a long discourse that is explaining the significance of the sign. Uh, and and so it's very often that we find uh, the I am statement is part of that discourse that is explaining the sign that he's done. So let's just look at a couple of examples here. I'll try and line it up side by side. All right. So the first one, I am the bread of life, John 6, John chapter 6. And, and of course, just before uh, he says, I am the bread of life, he's just fed uh, the 5,000. Okay. Uh, the second one, I am the light of the world. That's John 8 verse, verse 12. What's, what's happened before this? Well, in the next chapter, chapter 9, that's when he's going to be uh, healing a man uh, born blind, and then we'll find the statement come again, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. So he's giving, you know, he's opening the eyes of a, of a blind person, uh, which could mean that he's seeing, but of course, uh, op you know, opening the eyes of the blind is, 
you can have uh, you know physical seeing and you can have, also have spiritual seeing it's the idea of you know revelation as well um, or making something known and, and light is often it can be associated with goodness but it's very often uh, associated with, uh, with 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 revelation as well so it, it really fits the uh, fits with the sign that it comes with another example uh, I am the resurrection and the life chapter 11 where Jesus has just raised is just about to raise Lazarus from the dead, and and it's in that context that uh, that he says, "I am the resurrection um, and the life." As he says, "I'm the true vine," you know, he's he's he's, he's walking. He seems to be walking through. Probably he's walking through the Garden of Gethsemane or something like. There's probably a vine right there, and he's using that um, as uh, as a teaching aid, and and so on. So what that means is, whenever we're looking at the "I am" statements, we're we're always meant to understand them. Not just on their own, but where to see how they relate to the to the sign that's in the surrounding, uh, that, that's yeah, that's in the discourse, you know, preceding or after um, the discourse, right? So those are the I am statements, but those are not the only ways that that John emphasizes uh, Jesus' divinity, and and I think it is true that John really does emphasize Jesus' divinity in a way um, that is far more explicit uh, than, uh, than the other Gospels do. Now, we, we don't want to overplay this. It's, it's, not that the other, it's not that the synoptic Gospels don't present Jesus as divine, um, because they do. I mean, just think, uh, think for example, of uh, Jesus... Uh, Walking, uh, you know, walking on the water. Is that Mark chapter seven, where he, uh, where his uh, where he's walking? Uh, Mark chapter six, where he's walking on the water. And when he gets into the boat, he says, "Take heart, you know, it is I." Or literally, "Take heart, I am." Right? And we saw that that was a that was a statement of Jesus' divinity. And Jesus does things like calming the storm and raising the dead and healing the sick he, he does all these things that only god does so it's not that it's not that the uh, synoptic gospels don't present jesus as divine uh, of course they do but it's clearly far more prominent uh in the gospel of john so let's look at a few more examples of this apart from the uh, the I am statements, we also have quite a number of other, even just explicit statements of Jesus' divinity. So again, let's do one more round. And, uh, you know, Lemo, would you like to pick the next uh, pick the next person? Yeah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Sister Randy? John 1.18. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. I guess the next person is very weird. Um, John 5, 17, 18. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he in the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father. Making himself equal with God. John 10 30. I and the Father are one. Pastor Moses. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. All right. Uh, next, I want to call Santos. Thomas answered him, my Lord. And my God, Pastor Kim, you may go. John 20, verse 30, 31. 
Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Right. Now, let's just think about some of those, those statements. I mean, last week when we looked at the prologue, we noticed how the first and last verse of that prologue emphasizes the divinity of Jesus. So that's obviously very significant um, at, at, right at, at the front of, of John's gospel. But it's not only that it, it uh, kind of bookends the prologue, but it, it bookends the gospel itself, right? So we've got, we begin with a statement of Jesus' divinity here in 1 1. And we end with one at uh, John 20, 28. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And so when John eventually gets to his purpose statement, just cut two verses later, and he says, I'm writing this so that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It, it really makes, I think we're really forced to conclude at this point that Son of God here is not just, it's not just a statement of him being the Christ or not like the Messiah. But, but truly being the son of God, you know, the divine, um, the divine son, in a way very much like Mark's gospel, how it begins, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. And again, son of God that could just mean Messiah or Christ um, because the Messiah was called the son of God in the Old Testament, 277. But it does seem to very much push beyond that. that he's, he's the only son. He is, he's the divine uh, the divine son right and so we see jesus equating himself with the father so he's saying look i'm doing the father's work um him calling his calling even him just calling god his his father the jews understand that as a statement of divinity and so we could add others to this you know like so for example in john 14 where jesus says i am the way uh, sorry uh uh, uh, in my father's house, there are there are many rooms. If it were not so, uh, wouldn't I have come to, to tell you, right? So when Jesus says, in my father's house are many rooms, well, the fact, again, he's calling God his father, we should understand that as a claim to divinity. Because he says, I, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you in heaven. God decides who's in heaven and who's not. <laughs> but Jesus says, I'm, I'm, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. It's a divine claim. John 14, 1, believe in God, believe also in me. Saying, look, believe in me in the same way that you believe in God. It's a divine claim. Uh, so he's very much saying that, uh, that he and the Father are, are one, and you can't get that any more uh, clearer than John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. They're, they're one in their being. They're one in their character. They're one in their purpose. They're one in their work. Jesus' words are the Father's words. Jesus' works are the Father's, uh, you know, works. Jesus' glory uh, is the, brings glory to the Father and so on. And uh, Jesus' power is the Father's power. So that's why I, in John 14, Philip says, look, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. And and Jesus replies, have I not been with you so long and you still do not know me? How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe the Father? I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Well, what, you know, what do you mean, show, show God? If you've known me, you already know what God is like. You've already seen what God is like because I'm revealing what God is like to you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, very um, stark in the claims here that, of, of who Jesus is. Um, and, and perhaps that is one of the reasons why John's gospel, you know, becomes so popular in the early, in the early church and, and, and even, even down to today, because it has this, what we call high Christology, very developed view of the divinity of Jesus, of the, tri of the Trinity and, and so on. So, uh, so don't, you know, don't let anyone ever come up to you and say, you know, where in the Bible does, it, you know, does it say that Jesus was divine or where, where, where does Jesus claim that he was God? I mean, bring, just bring them to John's gospel. And there's just so many examples, not just the I am statements, John 1, 1, you know, John, John 20, there's a, are a whole lot in between. It's just impossible to read John's gospel and not understand that 
it's claiming that Jesus is, uh, Jesus is divine. Now, there are actually even other ways that we see Jesus' divinity presented apart from uh, uh, just in those kind of uh, direct statements, if you like. And, and a good example of that is in um, John chapter 5, right? Uh, and that's in how Jesus is doing his, you know, doing his father's uh, work. So I'm going to just uh, uh, close it here and open the passage and have a look at the passage itself in John 5. And uh, in the context here is that Jesus has just uh, uh, healed this uh, paralyzed man at the pool, and he's done it on the Sabbath, and the Jews are unhappy that he did it on the Sabbath. Right? And, and Jesus uh, justifies his action. He says, my father is working until now, and I am working. Uh, now, what work is it talking about? Well, God has completed his work of creation. He rests on from his creation work on the seventh day. But I think it's really talking about the work of redemption. God's, God's at work all throughout the Old Testament. And Jesus is continuing that work of, of redemption. And they understand this as a divine claim, right? This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. So now in the following passage, Jesus goes on to defend his uh, divinity. And uh, the way that he does that is basically to say that he is doing the whatever he sees the father doing, he is doing the father's work. So verse 19, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son of the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing and greater works than these will he show him so that you may, may marvel. Right? So Jesus is saying here that he is doing the father's work. The father is showing the son what he's doing and the son does it, right? Uh, and we see another uh, similar statement like that down in verse, uh, verse 36. Uh, he says, the, for the works that the Father has given me to, to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. In other words, as we... As we see what Jesus is doing, like his, his signs uh, and, and so on, we actually are meant to conclude that he is the son of the father, therefore he is he's making himself equal with God. It's a divine claim. So what are some of the works that are mentioned here? Well, in verse uh, 20, 21, we have the idea of uh, raising the dead, giving life. As the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also... The son gives life to whomever he will. So Jesus raises the dead. He gives life, just like the father. Or judgment, verse 22. The father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son. See a similar idea down in verse 27. He has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. So God, you know, God's rightly the judge of the world, but Jesus God has given, the Father has given judgment over to the Son. Uh, we have the idea of receiving honour in verse 23. Why has the Father given judgment to the Son? That all may honour the Son, just as they honour the Father. Whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. Right. So Jesus is going to have an equal honour to the Father. And, in fact, if you want to honour the Father, you have to give the Son the same honour. Or verse 26, the idea of having life in himself, right? Uh, I think we call that the, the attribute of a saiety, right, or of being a source of life. So verse 26, as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son to have life in himself. So, uh, you know, God is self-existent he doesn't need anyone to keep him alive in fact he is the he is the giver of all life and this is saying well jesus is just like the father jesus himself 
has this quality of life in himself, uh, granted, granted by the Father. So uh, John's gospel is very clear there, but it just even by looking at Jesus' works, his signs, um, we are to conclude that Jesus is divine. He does the Father's works. He speaks the Father's words. He seeks the Father's glory. It's glorified with the Father. Um, and, and all these things testify um, that he is divine. So I'm going to just stop there. Is there any questions you want to ask about the I am statements or, or, or Jesus' divinity? Yes, Reverend, Reverend Tim. Mm -hmm. I would just like to hear um, your comment on verse 25, where it says an hour is coming and it's now here. Yes. Yeah. All right. Let me just open the passage. Yeah. So we need to pick that up in, in just from the context here, right? This is uh, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. Right? Notice he's saying, look, if you've believed in Jesus, eternal life is a present possession. It's not something future. It's something that you possess right now yeah you have eternal life um he does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life in other words uh because when you put your faith in jesus your um there's 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 no more judgment that you have to face and the reason for that is because later in the gospel jesus is going to die on the cross to pay for our judgment he's going to take God's, God's wrath uh, on our sin in our place, and he'll die for us. Um, but the wrath that, that Jesus is taking, or the judgment that he's taking, is the judgment from the end, right? The final judgment. So Jesus takes the, the punishment from the final judgment, and he bears it on himself now, ahead of time, in the present, on the cross, right? Um, and that's why if we're Christians and we've put our, our trust in Jesus, we don't need to fear the judgment day because it's already been paid in full at the, at the cross, right? Um, we've already got the verdict from the end, right? So if you, if you like, there's a judgment day, God's going to judge us, but we already know what the verdict is. We're going to be not guilty. We're going to be justified and so on. Um, so that's what it's getting at here, right? If you've believed in Jesus, you have eternal life as a possession, now you have crossed over you've passed from death to life now right in other words you you already possess this eternal life you already possess this resurrection life and that's what he's getting at now in verse 25 which you picked up truly truly i say to you an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the son of god and those who hear will live right um, he only flips to the future when you, you come down here to verse uh, 28, right? Do not marvel at this. An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who've done good to the resurrection of life and those who've done evil to the resurrection uh, of, of judgment, right? So uh, there's this interplay going on here between uh, the present and the future, Right. And so in the present, if we're believers in Jesus, we already have eternal life. And that, of course, guarantees that at the end, we will be resurrected to life, um, not resurrected to judgment. It also helps us understand that final statement there, where he says, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. I mean, he's not saying, look, if you be a good person, then you're going to get to heaven. If you're a bad person, then you go to hell. Because he's already disqualified. How do you get eternal life? He who hears my word believes him who sent me. You, you get to heaven by faith, faith in Jesus. Right? That's, that's what it means to be good, um, is that you've, you've turned to the son as opposed to rebelling against the son. Can, can I just uh, uh, ask a question based on what Terry asked? You know, um, yeah. We talk about judgment just now because we, we fear no judgment because Christ is our righteousness. But there are 
there are certain preacher that mention them, but you know, at at the end, God is going to reveal everything that you know being done. You know, whether it's <laughs> nothing, it will be hidden, and they kind of like put fear in 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 a lot of people. You know, um, they they kind of say, okay, at the end of the day, uh, everyone is going to watch your life. You know, that they, they put in the screen in the <laughs> and then. Well, everything you know, you, you whatever you're going through in your mind, or something that everything will be exposed. So, what what is your comment on that? I mean, I I I kind of not fully agree with that uh, because I believe God has paid it all. Um, so I, I don't know. It's what what is is that to do with the judgment or is to do with the reward or what is your position on that, Reverend Tim? All right, good question again. And yes, the Bible does talk about a judgment of all people and um, including Christians and we will have to give an account uh, of our lives at the end so let's just have an example of that from, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 right um, so he says this uh, verse, let's pick up from verse 9 whether we are at home or away we make it our aim to please him no he's saying we right? including you know Paul Paul, Paul the apostles etc for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he's done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the law, we persuade others. Right. So there, there are other verses like, like that one in the New Testament, um, which say, yes, we, we are going to be judged for everything that we've done. Yeah, it, 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 it's all written in the books. It will all come to be. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're going to be condemned as Christians, right? Um, because, as I said, our punishment has already been paid in full at the cross. So there still will be, an, a, you know, a judgment or an accounting of our our, our words, but there won't be a, a punishment for, for Christians for those things because um, it's already the punishment has already been been paid. And and of course the other side of this, the New Testament does at various points talk about rewards, you know, treasures in heaven, um, and so on. So that also suggests that um, well, all of that suggests that what you do now matters, right? Uh, just because you've forgiven, been forgiven of everything doesn't mean that it doesn't matter how you live. Right? Um, it, it, it profoundly matters how, how you live. And you see it's a, that, that's a, a motivating factor for Paul, right? Knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we persuade others. Yeah. Now, it's not his only motivation. He's also motivated by the love of Christ, in just a few verses later. Um, but... Yeah, I think that's that's how we look at it. So, yeah, it's not uh, as as Christians we don't fear the final judgment in any way. We're not going to be condemned. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans five verse one. Um, we've passed from death to life. We don't come into judgment, says John chapter five. Um, but even though that's the case, even there's no punishment we still just stand before his judgment throne and, and give an account for our lives. Yeah. Uh, so you've got to hold those two things together. Do you want to ask, ask any more to clarify that? The word judgment is, I don't know what, whether it's the right word to use, but <laughs> it sounds, uh, but, well, I understand where you're coming from because Paul did mention about, you know, um, we're going to, you know, uh, receive reward according to, what we have done here, some will be just barely get by, <laughs> scrap through. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not that we're getting into heaven by our works. It's not that at all, right? Because none of us can earn our way to heaven. We can't be justified by our works. So the reason we're going to heaven is not because we scrape through by being good enough. No, um, we're either in heaven because we believed in Jesus, or we're not in heaven because we didn't. Yeah. It's, it's binary in that. So your faith in Jesus is the defining factor. But all we're saying is um, the fact that we've believed in Jesus and we're not 
punished. It doesn't mean that it doesn't matter how we live. Yeah, um, it still matters how we live. Yeah, and God still sees what we do. And yeah, and, and we will stand before Christ at the end. Yeah, I I agree with that, Reverend Tim, because that theology is very important how we, we live our life because some some I believe the the hyper grace or whatever so some people they just live their uh, I don't know their, their life you know because they, anyway we have been being forgiven by God and they don't really look into uh, the preaching about the fear of the Lord and I mean it, it's quite rare to hear in the churches nowadays because it's something that most people that don't like to hear about it Mm. I think there must be a balance in that. Mm. So the way, the way the book of Revelation puts it is you have the idea of the, the, there's the books and the book or the book of life of the lamb who was slain is the full name of it in Revelation. So the books record everything that everyone's ever done. And they're judged according to their works. Right? If you like, the books are the record of you know, all we've ever said, thought or done. And, and judgments on the basis of what what we've done that's fair right so there's the books but then it also talks about the book the book of life of the lamb and so if anyone's name is not in the book the book of life then they're thrown into the lake of fire right so you see how it works you're, you're judged according to your works the books but whether or not you're in the lake of fire or you're in the new creation is based upon whether your name is in the book, right? i.e., that is, have you trusted in Christ? Yeah. So yeah, you see this in in various places in the New Testament. Yeah. <laughs> so it's quite a tricky question, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think since we've got a bit of time today, then let's let's uh, jump to the second topic, which is about the person and work uh, of of the Spirit, which you will find at the end of the notes on page uh, twenty two, right? Uh, and you you basically you just see a whole bunch of uh, of, of Bible passages here, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide us up into a, a couple of groups here, and I'm going to get you to look up those verses and try and summarize what does it say about the person and work of the spirit right? now i've already put it under some headings obviously that will that will help you but i want you to try and fill it out in terms of the details of of what is said about the spirit under uh, under those headings uh, so what you can see from that is that john has a lot to say about the Holy Spirit, right? Um, the first point that we didn't talk about is that uh, the Spirit is divine, right? So the Spirit is talked about as a he, not an it, right? He's not a force, you know, like uh, Star Wars or something like that. Um, but he's talked about as a, as a he, right? Um, and you would have noticed... Um, you would have noticed that pronoun he when it, as you were looking at some of those, those passages. And, and it talks about how, uh, what, what will he do? Well, he will teach, like he will teach, or it says we will, we will know the Holy Spirit. Um, these are, you, you can't know an object. You can't know an ironing board, right? You can't know, um, um, you know, a plate of nasi lemak, right? You can't have a relationship with an object, <laughs> Um, I know people, some people will name their cars and things like that and treat them like objects, but you can't have, really have a relationship with an object. But we can know, know the Holy Spirit. He can teach us. He does, he, he does things. He convicts us and so on. So he's being depicted in personal uh, terms, right? And he's clearly related to the Father and the Son, right? He proceeds from the Father and the Son, some of the passages said, is sent by the Father or poured out by the Father and the Son. And as the Spirit comes to dwell in our hearts, that means that the Father dwells in our hearts and, 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 and Christ dwells in our hearts. And so the Spirit is very clearly being presented um, as divine in the same way as the Father and, um, and, and the Son are presented as divine. And so you can see that John's Gospel is a great, gospel to come to to think about christology you know the divinity of jesus and his relationship with 
you know, in relationships in the Trinity. It's also the place that you will go to develop your doctrine of the Holy Spirit and see the divinity of the Holy Spirit and see the work of the Holy Spirit as well. And so as we read John's gospel, this is where we have a lot of data that helps us to understand the Trinity and the, 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 the interpersonal relationships within the Trinity, right? So they all seem to have different roles, don't they? I mean, um, the Spirit's role seems to be in particular, right, about bringing the changed heart, right? So he brings the new birth, right? Um, he enables us to bear witness to Jesus. He he points us to Jesus. He reminds us of Jesus' word. You see how the Spirit is he's always pointing away from himself and he's pointing forward, he's, he's pointing to Jesus. He's pointing to Jesus' words. He's point, pointing to Jesus' works um, and he's helping people to believe in Jesus. You see, so if you've understood the work of the Spirit, right, what's the Spirit doing? The Spirit's pointing us to Christ, right? So in other words, a, a, a very spiritual church, a Holy Spirit-filled church, will be a church that talks a lot about Jesus, isn't it, rather than talking a lot necessarily about um, the Holy Spirit himself, right? Uh, so, yeah, so I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. If you're ever uh, coming to think about the Trinity, the Spirit, the divinity of Christ, John's gospel is, has got to be a place to come, especially John 14 to 16. All right, so for the rest of our time, we're going to be doing uh, an overview of John chapters 11 to 21. And we've already started to familiarize ourselves with, with that material as we've been uh, thinking about the, uh, the I am statements and also uh, the work of the spirit. So uh, now let's just uh, orient ourselves again. Uh, there are some people like, like Stib who sees uh, chapters 11 and 12 as belonging to the book of signs. Remember a, a lot of uh, commentaries will talk about the book of signs, uh, which is, you know, chapters two to 12. And then they'll talk about the book of glory, chapters 13 uh, to 20. And then they'll have introduction or prologue at the beginning, chapter one, and then epilogue, chapter 21 at the end, right? So in that sense, uh, for those commentators, 11 and 12 belongs with the chapters before it, right? Uh, the Book of Science. Uh, others, uh, such as, uh, you know, William Taylor, we talked about, see chapters 11 and 12 belonging with the material that follows it, right? So, you know, we have the resurrection of Lazarus in chapter 11, a whole lot about the death of Jesus in chapter 12. And that seems to, uh, to match with, you know, the death of Jesus uh, in chapter 19 and then uh, the resurrection of Jesus in uh, in chapter 20 kind of uh, something like a, a chiasm or bookend right um, so either way you either way you look at it uh, you see uh, chapters 11 and 12 are kind of form a really important transition uh, in the book of John right and so if uh, you know if we're right to you know recognize in John's gospel a kind of uh, new shape right so where you know the first half of the book we've got Jesus being sent by the father and uh, and coming down to do the father's work and then in the second half of the book with you know this strong focus on Jesus uh, being lifted up and returning uh, to the father and then pouring out the spirit then it, so if it has that, that kind of U shape to it then chapters 11 and 12 are the bottom of the U you know that they're, they're the, the transition point or the, uh, or the turning point. Uh, now, uh, Steve and others point out that the raising of Lazarus in chapter 11 is the seventh, um, uh, this is where we, yeah, the seventh uh, miracle of, in, in the ministry of Jesus. And it's certainly the last straw for the Jewish authorities who are going to be turning on Jesus uh, to, to crucify him. Um, and after that, you know, we've, we've got Jesus retreating to the upper room and then uh and then his arrest and, and passion so for all those reasons chapters 11 and 12 seem to be uh really important in holding the two um halves of 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 the book together so let's dive in a bit more more detail here so chapter 11 of course is about the the resurrection of of lazarus and we get the purpose of the miracle straight up front when jesus hears that he's ill uh, he says, this illness does not lead to death. Uh, it is for the glory of, 
uh, of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it, right? So the purpose of this miracle is going to be the glory of God, and it's going to be the glory of God through the glory of Jesus. Uh, it's very interesting in John's gospel, how, how is the Father glorified? The Father is glorified as the Son is glorified. So the Son seeks to glorify the Father, the Father seeks to glorify the Son. And so in doing this miracle, the Son will be glorified, and therefore the Father uh, will be will be glorified as well. And it's, it's slightly uh, strange, given that uh, uh, Lazarus is, is described here as the uh, he whom you love. It's quite surprising that Jesus doesn't immediately go to to help him because of course we know by this point jesus has the power to heal uh, but he doesn't he stays for two days um, he waits to ensure that lazarus dies um, and and only after two days he says well let, okay let's go and he says uh our friend lazarus has fallen asleep i will go to awaken him it's a beautiful thing isn't it a way of talking about death death is falling asleep because for the Christian, death's not the end. Um, we, we will rise rise again. And so he says, look, Lazarus, Lazarus is, has fallen asleep. I'm going to wake him up. Now, the disciples, they don't understand what's going on here, right? Um, they think he's talking about literal sleep. And so that means he's probably going to get better. Um, but Jesus tells them literally next, right? He says, actually, Lazarus is dead right i'm going to raise him up and again we get the purpose of the miracle for your sake i'm glad i was not there so that you may believe right? so we're already told what the significance of this miracle is it's going to uh, this sign is going to show the glory of god the glory of jesus and it's going to result in uh, belief or faith now that should remind us a lot about uh, the first sign that we had in Cana, uh, do you remember Jesus turned the water to wine? We were told that uh, this is the first of his signs manifested his glory. His disciples believed in him. So we're seeing a very similar thing happen as we, uh, as we come here to chapter 11. So Martha goes to Jesus and she's, uh, and, and it's exploring the question of whether uh, Jesus is able to really help in verses 17 to, to 22, um, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So she knows that Jesus could heal him. But even then, she still trusts Jesus despite Lazarus's death. Verse 22, even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give it to you. And Jesus declares, verse 23, your brother will rise again. And then comes, you know, that, uh, that I am statement. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So Jesus says that he is the source of resurrection life. Now, we've, we've already seen uh, other passages in John's gospel saying that you know, Jesus is the Jesus is the life giver. He has life in himself. He, he he's going to raise the get, raise the dead and give them life. There's many passages like that in the earlier chapters, but here, you know, it's captured in this climactic statement: "I am the resurrection, resurrection, and the life." And we need to understand this in the in the Old Testament uh, context. The the resurrection was basically the judgment day. So, if we were going to go to Daniel chapter twelve. Uh, that's very clear. Uh, so we see in Daniel chapter 12, uh, and many who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Right? So the resurrection, and, and we're told uh, that Daniel is to seal this up until the time of the end. So the resurrection time was the end time. It was the judgment day. It was, it was the day when people are raised from their graves and then they either go to, to death um, or to life. And we've already seen Jesus, uh, you know, alluding to that, to that very passage at the end of, uh, of John chapter, uh, chapter 
chapter five, he said, look, with the hours coming, when all who are in the tomb will hear the voice, uh, hear his voice, come out, those who've done good to the resurrection of life, those who've done evil to the resurrection of, of judgment. So for Jesus to say that, that he is the resurrection and the life then, he is he's really declaring that uh, he is uh, he's bringing in that the age of the end, you know, the new age. He's bringing in he's bringing in the judgment day, and he's the one who's going to bring that that resurrection life, and uh, so that we can belong to uh, the new age uh, of of the kingdom. Uh, and, and, and by healing, I mean, by raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus is going to validate that claim. He's going to give a foretaste or an anticipation of the resurrection life he can bring. Now, of course, Lazarus is, uh, he's not, he doesn't receive resurrection life in the sense that he becomes immortal. It's, it's, it's more like a resuscitation in the sense that, you know, Lazarus is going to die again um, eventually. Uh, but it's a it's a it's a foretaste or anticipation of that resurrection life uh, that he's going to bring. Now that's it, with that context, it's really interesting to see verses twenty nine to thirty seven. Jesus is pictured totally in control. Uh, he knows what's going to happen. He knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, right? Because he has resurrection life in himself. And yet, as he he comes to the tomb. He's just overwhelmed with, with grief. Right? Look at verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit. He was greatly troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. The Jews said, see how he loved him. So isn't that interesting that even though Jesus has the power to raise Lazarus from the dead. And he's about to do that just a few verses later. Face to face with death, Jesus still weeps, deeply troubled, deeply moved. Uh, and, and that's helpful for us to remember as Christians, I think, yeah, um, as we're seeking to comfort people who've lost loved ones. Right? Yes, we know if they've died as Christians, they're going to be... Um, they, they're going to be raised at the, at the end. Um, that, that we, we will see them again in the new creation. And so in that sense, we can grieve without hope. But death is still a confronting thing. Death is still a great evil. Death separates us from our loved ones. And so even Jesus, face to face with the death of his friend, um, wept, um, even though he would raise him. Uh, and then we see the glory of uh, the glory of God and the glory of the Lord Jesus as uh, as he raises Lazarus uh, from the dead. It's now been four days as an odor. Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And he prays and he says, Lazarus, come out. And the dead is raised to life. And Jesus proves he does have that power to bring resurrection life. Now, the final part of the chapter, we have then the responses to this, uh, this great um, miracle. And there's essentially two of them. On the one hand, many, many believed in him. And, and of course, that's, that's quite expectant. Verse 45, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what he did, believed in him. And they see this great sign, and it has the, the response that Jesus expected. They believe in him. But many don't. Right. Um, the second response we see here is hard-hearted rebellion. The, the Jewish leaders are unable to deny the sign that Jesus has done, this remarkable raising a man from the dead, which has been witnessed by a great crowd of people. They can't deny he's done a great miracle, uh, but they don't come to believe in him. They call the council together. Uh, this is the Sanhedrin, the full, you know, the full council, to work out what are they going to do with this with this Jesus who's, who's becoming such a threat to them. They say, what are we to do for this man performs many signs? And they're not denying the science, the truth of what Jesus has done. It, but if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. 
and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And so it's, it, it's an awful response. Uh, instead of believing, him, believing in him like they know that many people are, rather driven by fear, they want to get rid of him. See, they fear the power of the Romans more than the power of God. They seek the glory of men more than the glory of God. And they're more worried about losing their temple and losing the nation, the Jewish state, than whether or not Jesus is from God. That's irrelevant. They don't care whether he's from God. Even if he is from God, they're still going to put him on the cross because what matters to them is not the fear of God, but the fear of men, the love of self. And there's a deep, uh, there's a deep insight into the, human, into the human heart. Why don't we want to believe in Jesus? Why do people not believe in Jesus? Because they want to remain in control. They don't want the status quo to be shifted. And they would rather receive glory for themselves than having to give it to another person. Well, Caiaphas comes up with an ingenious solution here. Uh, I mean, ingenious in the sense that it's a it's good politics, but it's really an evil action. And Caiaphas has here's his solution: You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it's better that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Right? Do you see his political solution? Kill Jesus. There'll be no rebellion. There'll be no, you know, uh, uh, response from the Romans. Yes, it's wrong to kill someone, but the end justifies the means. Now, it's a rather irrational thing that they're planning on doing. I mean, are they really going to succeed in killing a man who's just raised someone from the dead? <laughs> uh, but that's what they plan to do. They begin making plans to crucify him. But uh, John tells us that there's actually a deeper thing going on here because Caiaphas is the high priest and he says that he's actually prophesying. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but, to, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So yes, Jesus is going to die. And yes, it's an evil thing that the religious leaders are doing, but actually this is the, this is the plan of God, um, not just to save Israel, but to save the world. And we should hear the echoes here of John 3.16. It's better that one man should die, not that the whole nation should, should perish. Remember John 3.16. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life so god's plan is that jesus is going to die for us as a substitute so that the world will not perish the religious leaders are doing evil but god is uh, working out uh, his his plan and so they begin uh, they begin plotting his death and that leads jesus to end his public Ministry. He doesn't. Uh, he doesn't go out in public anymore, in open spaces, and he only stays with his disciples. And we'll see that in chapters thirteen to seventeen, as uh, he's uh, he's with uh, uh, the disciples in the upper room. Uh, and it's at this point where the, the Passover is mentioned, and that's really significant, given the the, the one for many kind of theology that uh, we've just talked about. Uh, John is implying here that Jesus is going to die as the, as the Passover lamb, fulfilling the plan of God. So that's chapter 11. Then we come to, okay, we'll keep going for chapter 12 then. And here, uh, chapter 12, uh, where we begin preparing for, for the Passover. We've told it six days before the Passover now. And in this episode at, at Bethany, we're, we're, we're basically asked to consider our response to Jesus, to Jesus. Will we kill him or will we worship him? And Jesus is having a, a dinner 
uh, is at a dinner in honor of Lazarus, who has been you know, raised from the dead, we're told. And it's at that dinner that Mary gets this very expensive ointment, pours it on Jesus' feet and wipes it with her hair. So this extra, extravagant act of worship. And that's contrasted with the response of Judas, uh, who we're told is greedy for money. Right? He's angry. Why was this money not sold and given to the poor? But he doesn't care about the poor. We're told that he's in charge of the money. He's the finance officer, and he's stealing from the money bag for himself. Right? Um, so he's angry because he could have got a good cut uh, from selling this, selling this ointment. Um, so there's the choice. Are we going to kill Jesus or are we going to worship him? And Judas is choosing one way and Mary is, is choosing the other way. But Mary is vindicated. Jesus says, leave her alone. She's prepared me for my death. Of course, when a, a body died, they'd be anointed with expensive perfume. And, and Jesus says, look, she's preparing me uh, for my death. Uh, the Jews have a similar response. Um, not only are they trying to kill Jesus, but now they want to kill Lazarus too, because people are believing uh, because of, of Lazarus. But nothing seems to go to plan. Next, we have the triumphant entry, which we've, we've already talked about another number of times uh, in, in the other Gospels. But note how, uh, how uh, John ends his account here. The Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And with that mention of the world going after Jesus, then we have, uh, we're told this episode of uh, a few Greeks uh, arriving and, and wanting to come and see Jesus. And Jesus sees as, as these Greeks, these, uh, you know, these non-Jews turn up seeking Jesus. Jesus understands that as the signal that the hour has finally come for his death. Remember he, earlier in the gospel, he's saying, look, the hour is, is not yet. The hour is not yet. The hour is not yet. Well, now he says, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. And the hour he's talking about, it's very clear. He's talking about his, his death, right? Just like a seed needs to die, before it can, you know, to be, it needs to be buried in the ground before it can grow into a tree and give life. So Jesus needs to die so that he can give that resurrection life that we were just talking about in chapter 11. And not only does he say that he needs to die so that there can be, there can be life, but whoever follows him needs to die so that they can receive this resurrection life as well. Whoever loses his life, uh, whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Right? So in order to receive this resurrection life, Jesus must die. In order to receive this resurrection life, we must die uh, and follow Jesus wherever he goes and serve Jesus uh, however uh, we ought. He, he, would, he would have us do. And, and so... Uh, then Jesus, uh, Jesus prays, and he says that this, uh, his death is not just going to be about uh, bringing resurrection life to those who will follow him and believe in him, but his death will bring glory to the Father. Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came, I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. I will glorify it again. Uh, there's a really important insight that we get from these verses. I mean, very often I think we are, we're quite men-centered in the way that we think about the cross. Right? We think, you know, Jesus loves me and Jesus loved me so much that he went to the cross so that he could save me and so that I can have life, I can have eternal life and so on. And, of course, that's all true. I mean, Jesus does love us and he does go to the cross because he loves us and he wants to save us and give us eternal life. But here we see there's a more fundamental reason why he goes to the cross. And that is because he loves his father. Right? 
because he wants to glorify his father. He goes to the cross first and foremost because that's the will of God. Yeah. Uh, Jesus is troubled by his death, but he's willing to do it because the father's will is, is the father's glory is more important uh, even than than his own uh, even than his own life. Uh, and and so Jesus uh, declares that uh, as he as he dies, um, that's going to be the judgment of the world and salvation for the world as well. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out, and I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Now this this idea of lifted up here. It does have connotations of kind of being exalted or being glorified or, um, or, or, or being honoured. I mean, we sing a, one of those uh, uh, songs, isn't it? Lord, we lift your name on high, you know. Uh, it's just, you know, we say that means we're, we're praising him or we're exalting him. But there's a play on words here because John's actually clearly talking about Jesus' crucifixion, right? John adds here, verse 33, he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. In other words, where is Jesus going to be exalted? Where is Jesus going to be honoured and glorified as he's crucified, as he's lifted up on the cross? Now, do you see what John is, John is trying to help us to see? that the place where we most clearly see the glory of God and the glory of Jesus is as he's crucified. Right? Jesus' death reveals the glory of God. Um, that's not usually how we think. We think glory is seen in success and victory and intelligence and power and status and but do you see how the gospel overturns the world's values and look like the opening chapters of one corinthians will you know talk more about this but no god's glory is seen in the cross there we see the perfect obedience of the father of the son to the father there we see god's overflowing grace as he dies in the place of sinners there we see the glory of god as as jesus is is crucified yeah um martin luther famously um wrote about that we, we need to have a theology of the cross not a theology of glory and and this is what he's getting at here we need to see the cross as glory rather than everything else that the world normally sees as, as, as glory. Well, all this uh, leads to a, a kind of final appeal. Remember, Jesus is just about to withdraw from the crowds. After this, he's only going to be in the upper room, then he's going to be you know, crucified and, and, and risen. So this is like his last kind of public interactions uh, with the Jews. And so he, he gives one final warning. Right? The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. You see, it's this one last plea to recognize Jesus as the light of the world, to believe in him and to become a child of God. Yeah. But in the following verses, we see that that final appeal is once again uh, rejected. And it's explained in terms of these two passages from the book of Isaiah. The first one, this is Isaiah 53, verse 1. Right? Um, Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So even though Jesus is revealed in glory through all of his signs and all of his works and all of his words, 
they still reject him. Fulfilling Isaiah 53, that prophecy about the suffering servant, continues, therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he's blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their hearts in turn. And I would see them. Isaiah 6 has this great vision of, you know, the holy and glorious God. And, and, and John says, well, that was actually a vision of Jesus. But instead of seeing the glory of Jesus, they have their eyes closed. They reject him. They're planning to put him to death. And that's the, that's the heavenly reason, if you like. The heavenly reason for their rejection is uh, God ordained it. Right? God has hardened their hearts, blinded their eyes, and he wants to see the scriptures fulfilled, and he's got a plan, and Jesus needs to die as part of that plan. That's the heavenly reason why Jesus is being rejected and healed. But there's also an earthly reason, and that's unpacked here, verse 42. Um, Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They're people pleasers, you see. They care more about their own comfort and what other people think of them than they care about the truth. And there are many people who reject Jesus for that reason. They know that it's all true. They know that the Bible is true. They know that Jesus is the Christ. They know that he's the savior of the world, but they don't want to believe because their parents won't like it or um, their friends won't like it or they don't want to be uncool or their life will have to change. They care more about what people think than what, what God thinks. And as we come to chapters uh, 13 to, uh, to 17, we're now into the, uh, you know, the, the, the upper room discourse and, and, and all of that. Jesus is withdrawn from... Uh, from the public, and now he's with his disciples, um, preparing them for his departure. And the, the timing really slows down here. I mean, we've chapters one to twelve has been a period of about three years, uh, but the rest of the the gospel really covers mostly just about twenty four hours. Um, the period of his, uh, you know, the Last Supper, and then his crucifixion. So, just like in the other gospels, John really wants to focus our attention on the central events. And uh, this upper room discourse in particular is uh, explaining what his departure will mean for the disciples uh, and, and for the world as it's just about to enter in this new age or this new, new phase of, of salvation history. So chapter 13 is, uh, uh, of course, Jesus washing the disciples feet it's it's all about the love of jesus contrasted to the evil and hatred of the devil and judas right so uh, we're told in verse one having loved his own who were in the world he loved them to the end so we're meant to see the great love for jesus expressed in his foot wash in the foot washing but even that just an anticipation of the even greater love he's going to show as he lays down his life on the cross. But that's contrast in the very next verse to what Judas is doing, right? The devil has already put it into the heart of Judas to betray him. Uh, and so Jesus expresses his love as he, he dresses as a servant, washes his disciples' feet. That's something that even a, you know, that was a job of a slave, um, the disciples never thought to wash, even disciples didn't wash, think to wash Jesus' feet, let alone Jesus washing, washing their feet. And verse 10 here, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but he's completely clean. You are clean, but not every one of you. So what this is getting at is that him cleansing their feet is anticipating the, you know, the, the total cleansing that he's going to win for them as he dies for them at the cross. You know, they've believed in him. They've already crossed from death to life. They're already completely clean. Uh, but not all of them, because one of them, Satan's about, uh, uh, Judas, is, is, is about to betray him. And so the betrayal of Judas just kind of overshadows this, this passage 
uh, with, a, with a very somber, somber mood. Uh, his betrayal is depicted as a fulfillment of the scriptures. Uh, this verse here from uh, Psalm 41, he who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. But here is Jesus, you know, I, Jesus is washing Judas's feet, you know, and Jesus is about to, uh, you know, offer bread to, 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 to Judas, but it's rejected. And uh, at the end of this episode, uh, having received the morsel of bread, you know, this sign of, you know, fellowship and, and love from Jesus, immediately he goes out. And we're told it was, it was night. Now, of course, it was night. It was physically nighttime. But John likes to use this, you know, these metaphors, right? Jesus, remember, has described himself as the light of the world, right? The, the appeal went out in chapter 12, walk in the light while the light is still with you. And Judas leaves the light, walks out on Jesus, and he goes into the darkness, you know, prompted by Satan himself. It, it was night. We're meant to understand just this is the work of evil. This is a great evil. The Satan works in Judas to betray his own to betray his own master. Uh, and so I guess that's one of the, the, the beautiful uh, ways that, that John's gospel uh, progresses as he uses these metaphors of light and darkness. Uh, I mean, as the gospel is going to go on towards Jesus' crucifixion and, and so on, there's going to be a lot of evil happening, a lot of darkness. But in the midst of that darkness, the light of Jesus just shines all the more, all the more clearly. Um, you know, the glory of Jesus, his grace, his love, his truth. It's just all the more beautiful in the light of, of the evil that's, uh, that it's going on, uh, going on at the same time. So now we get into the, the farewell discourse kind of proper. And you'll notice most of it from this point on is pretty much all read all the way to chapter 17. It's mainly Jesus speaking. And it's really only interrupted by various questions that are asked by the disciples along the way. Lord, where are you going? Um, or, you know, or Thomas, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Show us the Father. Uh, it's enough for us. Right? Uh, Lord, how is it you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Uh, and, and so on. So the disciples are, are, are going to ask all these, these uh, questions as they're trying to come to grips with the fact that Jesus is about to leave them. Um, and these questions are going to, uh, uh, in response to these, Jesus is going to explain more fully what his departure means for, uh, for, for, for them and, and for the world. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing he says, though, is that this is... Uh, his departure is going to create a community of love. And here's we have, we have the new commandment. And a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, of course, the Old Testament law is summarized by love. Um, so in that sense, it's not, it's not new. But it is also new in the sense that... Uh, the standard of love, right, or the expression of love is, as I have loved you, you are to love one another. You know, this sacrificial, um, self-giving love it's, is what is going to characterize Jesus' disciples when he's gone. So Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And, uh, and Jesus essentially says he's going to die. Right? And he says, look, you, you can't come, Peter. He says, oh, no, I will, I will come. Jesus says, you can't come. Will, will you lay down your life for me? So Peter understands that uh, when Jesus says, you can't come, he's talking about his death. So Jesus is going to die, but then he's also going to go to the Father. Right? He says, if I were, uh, he says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house in many rooms, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, 
you also uh, may you may be also. So Jesus is going to the cross, and then via the cross, he's going to uh, his father. He's going to go ahead of the disciples. He's going to prepare a place for the disciples. And so Jesus is going to be uh, the way uh, to the Father. And here we have the next I am statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here's the way. Is the way to the Father because he's going to die and be raised. Here's the truth because he is the one who's going to reveal God. He is the life because he's the source of resurrection life. Uh, he will give eternal life. So this uh, prompts uh, Philip for another question. Look, I just, I just want to see God now. You know, just, just show us the Father now. That'll be enough. And he says, well, what are you talking about, Philip? How can, you, how can you ask me to show you the Father when I've been with you all along? Right? Um, don't you believe the Father is in me? I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And so Jesus goes on to explain him. His words are the Father's words. His works are the Father's works. His character is the Father's character. His glory is the Father's glory. Uh, there's such an intimate relationship between the Father and the Son uh, that we can say that the Father is in Jesus and Jesus is in the Father. And, uh, and, and so that the Father and the Son are, are united not only in in word and action, but they're, they're united in their very being, which is why we don't believe there is, uh, we don't believe in three gods, you know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We believe in three persons, but one God, because these three persons mutually indwell one another. The Father is in the Son. The Son is in the Father. Um, it, it's very hard to come up with an analogy for this, because God is unique, of course. I mean, the, the closest that you can get is maybe like a baby um, who is in, the, you know, in their mother's womb. They indwell the mother. And so where the mother goes, um, the baby goes. And what the mother eats, the baby eats. And if the mother smokes, which they shouldn't, then the baby smokes and gets sick and, and so on. What, whatever the mother does, the child does as well, because the child is in the mother. They're, they're united. But it's impossible to conceive of something I mean, the, the baby can be in the mother, but the mother can't be in the baby at the same time. Uh, but that's what's going on with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They're mutually indwelling one another so that they're, the Father is different to the Son and the Son is different to the Spirit and so on. They're, they're distinct persons, but they're also perfectly united. In word, indeed, indeed, in sharing the divine essence. And so we believe in a triune God, one God, three persons. Um, tr Trinity, tri means three, unity, one, three but one. Yeah. Three persons, one God. Yeah. Okay, so as, uh, as we see then, then because he's going to the Father, uh, this has various implications that are now, that are now brought out. And... Uh, he says, look, you'll do greater works than the son. Uh, now, what does it mean that, we're, that the disciples are going to do greater works than Jesus because he's going to the Father? Uh, it, I, I don't think it's about doing, you know, you know, miracles or speaking in tongues or these, these kinds of things. We've actually been told already what these greater works are right, in chapter 5. Right? The reading context is always really important. Uh, so chapter 5, verse uh, 20, we see this. The father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing and greater works than these. He will show him so that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he wills. And we'll see how that's summarized at the bottom here. Uh, whoever believes in Jesus has crossed from death to life. So what's the greater works? That the disciples are going to do well jesus is going to go to the father uh, that means that the spirit will be poured out and they're going to be able to bear witness uh, to to jesus and as they preach the gospel people are going to receive this resurrection life they're going to cross from 
from death to life. So this greater works is ultimately it's talking about, uh, you know, the spirit empowered preaching of the gospel. Uh, it's got nothing to do with doing miracles or things like this. Uh, I mean, how can you do greater miracles than Jesus? You know, I mean, Jesus walked on water and feeds 5,000 and all of that. I mean, are, are, we, are we going to do better than that? Are we going to feed 10,000 people? Uh, you know, it's not going to be greater in that sense or more numerous or something like that. No, it's the greater works as a reference back to chapter 5. Uh, it's also in that context that we understand this promise here that uh, whatever you ask, God will do it. Um, so it's not that, you know, you ask for a Mercedes, you're going to get a Mercedes. You're saying, look, as you're doing these greater works, as you're preaching the gospel, doing it prayerfully, then uh, the, the, the prayers is going to aid the task, right? Uh, he, he's going to answer the prayers and people are going to be saved. And the rest of the chapter, which you've already looked at here, as we've thought about the Holy Spirit, is that he's, when Jesus goes to the Father, we're not going to be orphaned. He's going to send the Spirit. And so the Father and the Son are going to uh, come and take uh, their home in us. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while. The world will see me no more, but you will see me. The Spirit is going to actually live in them. Uh, and and that's going to make uh, Jesus is going to live among them, and the Father is going to live among them. If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. My Father will love him. We will come to him, and make our home with him. I mean, isn't that a remarkable thought? Right? That if you're a Christian, that the Triune God has taken up residence in your heart poured out his spirit and by the spirit the father and the son dwell in you because they mutually indwell one another so if the spirit's in your heart the father's in your heart the son's in your heart uh, living amongst us just like the the temple in the old testament so we become temples of the holy spirit god's presence is in our is within us what a remarkable thought uh, that that is and that's why in these chapters jesus is saying look it's better that i go because i mean if if i stay then you can have my physical presence but if i go I, you can share in the life of the trinity i mean you can we, we can dwell in your hearts you can be united with the father and the son and the spirit in this even deeper and, and, and greater way. So that's why Jesus doesn't stay forever. He, 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 go, he dies and he goes to heaven because so that he can bring something greater, something deeper, as he sends the Spirit uh, to us. Now, this kind of union language is then picked up in chapter 15 with the, with the idea of the vine and the branches, the next I am statement. I am the vine, you are the branches. Of course, in the old... In the Old Testament, Israel is described as the vine. Right? So Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. We are, we are joined to him. Our, our life depends on uh, remaining connected to Jesus. And so if we don't abide in Jesus, we'll die, just like if you, you, know, you go and uh, buy uh, roses for someone or something like that to give to them. A couple of days later, the flowers are going to be dead, right? Because They've been chopped off uh, from, the, from the roots, from the stalk, right? And so they'll look pretty for one or two days and, and, and then they'll, they'll die. Same for us. If, we, if we're going to live, we have to remain connected to Jesus. That's what that idea of the vine um, is, is seeking to describe here. And how do we abide in, Je how do we abide in Jesus? Uh, well, we have to abide in his word. Right? Uh, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, right? so you, we abide in Jesus by listening to what he says and doing it, and in particular by loving one another because that's what his word to us is. Um, we abide in his love and in the Father's love as we keep his commandment to, to, to love, one, love one another. Okay, so that's the, that's, that, that's the vine. Now, from there, we start to think about 
what this is going to mean for the world. And uh, we see uh, here that the world is going to is going to hate them, going to hate Christians, just like it, it, it hates Jesus. A servant's not above his master. It is strange that uh, in many churches we have prosperity gospel preached. Right? You know, you believe in Jesus, everything's going to go well for you. But Jesus says here, look, don't expect that your life will be any different to mine. How was I treated? I was persecuted and, and killed. The servant's not above his master. If that's what they did to me, that's what they'll do to you as well. So Jesus is going to leave, and that means that we will face the same kind of suffering and, and persecution that, um, that, that Jesus did. And, and, and that shows that we are his people. See, if we belong to the world, the world would love us. But because we're different, because we're, because we're Jesus' people, that's why the world hates us. So it's a, it's a hatred that, that doesn't, doesn't have a cause. It's a, it's a hatred that, that doesn't make sense. And, and sometimes uh, people will even think they're serving God by killing, killing Christians. I mean, the Apostle Paul thought he was doing that when Stephen was being stoned. And there are plenty of religions today that think they're, they're, they're actually honouring God when they, you know, go into a church and set off a, a suicide bomb or something like that. Um, but where do we expect all these things? Um, because that's how, how Jesus was, was treated. Well, chapter 16, again, we focus in on the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and we see a, a lot about the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to really dwell on this because we've already talked about it. But he's going to convict the world. And he's, going to, he's described many times here as the spirit of truth who will guide you into all the truth. Now, one of the keys in understanding this chapter is that we need to understand that Jesus is still addressing the apostles here, right? So when it says the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Who's being addressed? It's the apostles. He's not addressing you or me directly, right? So it's the spirit is going to come upon the apostles it's going to remind them what Jesus said. It's going to enable them to preach it. And the way that we have access to that truth is then through the witness of the apostles. And where do we find the witness of the apostles? We find it in our Bibles, in the New Testament. So we shouldn't say, oh, the Spirit will lead you into all truth to mean that, you know, the Spirit is going to give you some, you know, some extra revelations or dreams or visions. That's something that's apart from the Bible. No. He leads the apostles into truth. They bear witness to the truth. They record it in the scriptures. And we know the truth through the scriptures. And the spirit helps us to know that truth through the scriptures, which he inspired. Right? And he helps us to understand with our new hearts. So the spirit should never be divorced from Christ, but he should also never be divorced from, uh, from the word of, of, of God either. Okay, uh, so chapter 17, then, we have uh, Jesus' uh, high priestly uh, prayer. And it's another one of those jewels in the Bible because, I mean, your prayers reveal what really matters to you the most. Uh, when you, what someone prays for is what they really care about, especially when they're suffering, right? Um, when someone is suffering, their prayers show what really matters to them. Um, but so do your last words, right? I mean, what someone prays when they're about to die, when they're at the point of death, that's when you really say what really matters. And so here we, we have this extended prayer where we, we showed what Jesus prays to his father on the night that, um, before he dies. And what does Jesus care about? He prays for glory. The hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. He wants God to be glorified. And that means he needs to be glorified as he goes to the cross. 
What does he pray about his, for his disciples? He, he prays um, that they will be uh, that they will be protected, that they will be that they will be kept, that they will be united. He says, Father, keep them in your name. Right. He wants them to be united, verse 11, that they may be one even as we are one, that they may have joy, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves, that they may be sanctified, verse, uh, verse 17 to 19, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. So he prays that we will be protected, that we'll be united, that we'll have joy, um, that we will remain his special people set apart in this world um, that is opposed for them. And then the last part of the prayer, he actually prays for us because he, he, he prays not just for the apostles, but he prays for those who will believe through their word. And that's us, isn't it? I mean, if we if we believe through the apostles' word, which we, we have, because we've, you know, we've read the New Testament, this is, this is his prayer for, for us. What does he pray? He prays that the church will be united. He prays that the world will be converted. He prays his mission uh, will be completed. It's a glorious prayer, uh, and I commend you to, to really study it in, in detail. Uh, that brings us to the, to the passion narrative, which we've, we have already talked about a little bit in, in the earlier lectures. Uh, and what, what John really presents to us in his, his passion narrative is he wants us to see uh, that Jesus, that, that idea of the one for the many, Jesus dying as the Passover lamb, Jesus dying as that, that suffering servant, he the innocent one taking the place of of the guilty, and there, there are various ways in which uh, uh, in which we see that. So, for example, with uh, the trials, and uh, John reminds us of what Caiaphas said, right, of how it would be expedient that one man for, should die for the die for the people. He just brings that up again in case you've forgotten it. And so we have Peter denying Jesus uh, on either side. Right, so we've got a couple of denials on one side, we've got another denial on the other. And then in the middle, we've got Jesus' trial. And like in the Synoptic Gospels, this kind of sandwich structure, it's forcing us to compare these, compare these two episodes. And the point is, is, is this. As Jesus, the innocent one, is being falsely condemned, uh, but he's being condemned for people like Peter who are who are failures who are who, who are sinners jesus the righteous standing in the place of sinful people the one dying for the many uh, jesus trial with pilate the focus is really on jesus uh, kingship and it, you can see it happens many comes up many times in the passage are you a king talks about my kingdom, so you are a king, you say that I am a king, king of the Jews. Uh, but the trial is really exploring what kind of kingdom is Jesus going to bring. And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. He's coming to bring a, a spiritual kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. And that's why the disciples are not fighting to protect him. That's why he's not trying to overthrow the Roman Empire. Um, and it's also a kingdom of, of truth. Jesus says, everyone who's on the side of truth listens to my voice. Pilate says, what is truth? Very famous quote from John's gospel. So Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of, of truth. If we want to live in the truth, we have to listen to what Jesus says. Jesus, Jesus is the truth. I am the truth. Jesus comes from the Father, full of grace and truth. So if we want to know truth, we have to listen to Jesus. If we reject Jesus, then we've embraced lights. We've embraced darkness instead of the light. Now, Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. It's mentioned many times in this passage. But he still sends Jesus to be flogged. Um, the soldiers twist the crown of thorns and so on. And eventually, to appease the crowds, he sends him off to be crucified. Pilate rejects the truth to protect his own little kingdom, 
He rejects Jesus' kingdom to keep his own. He loves the glory from men instead of the glory from God. He's not willing to embrace suffering. Instead, he, he pursues self-protection. Then there's the religious leaders, and they're presented as, uh, as uh, hypocrites, religious um, hypocrites. Uh, chapter 18, verse 28, as they, they, they're, they're handing Jesus over, but they don't even want to go into the headquarters because they don't, want to def- they don't want to be defiled and want to eat the Passover. So at the same time, they're worried about not being, you know, being ritually clean. They're arranging for the murder of an innocent person. We're meant to see the hypocrisy of it all. And this forces us as the readers then to think, how are we going to respond to Jesus? What do, what do we see? You know, do we see a scornful man, weak, rejected? Do we see a political threat? Do we see a religious nuisance? Or do we see the glory of Jesus? Do we see the kingdom of Jesus? Do we see the truth? And, and, and that's a, 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 a wonderful challenge that John presents through his, uh, through his gospel. Uh, the crucifixion account is, uh, is, is in some way similar to the other, to the other gospels, but there are uh, parts that are different as well, right? So they emphasize the Jesus uh, garments being uh, gambled for to fulfill the scriptures. Uh, they also uh, emphasize the fact that when, uh, when, uh, when Jesus dies, that uh, they, don't, they don't break his legs. And that's picking up from, uh, uh, from uh, the book of Exodus. Um, because in the book of Exodus, uh, they're not allowed to break any of the bones. Right? It's Exodus 12, verse 46, with the Passover lamb. As they eat the Passover, they're not allowed to break any of the bones. And again, it's, it's John's way of presenting to us that the, this, the central category in which we're to understand the death of Jesus is dying as the Passover lamb, the one for the many, the innocent for the guilty. He takes the punishment so that we, uh, so that we can go free. Uh, he's dead. He's buried. Then we have the resurrection accounts. And uh, John wants to emphasize a couple of things in his resurrection accounts. The first thing is that, that Jesus' resurrection is real and historical. He really goes to, to, to pains to show that. Uh, he shows that the first witness is a woman, which would be unusual if you were trying to make it up because a woman's testimony wouldn't be accepted in court. So if you're trying to fabricate the truth, you wouldn't have a woman as the first, uh, the first witness. Uh, there's various historical details, like uh, like John outrunning Peter. Um, he talks about the face cloth being folded and, and placed by itself, which you know couldn't have uh, couldn't have happened unless it was a very deliberate action of a resurrected person, uh, and so on. So he wants to emphasise that it, this is a real and historical uh, event uh, that has happened, and he also wants to emphasise that Jesus has a a glorified physical body, and uh, and Mary has some time has some trouble uh, recognizing Jesus at first. Right? She 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 thinks that Jesus is she, Jesus is the garden gardener. Now, is that just because she is uh, she's in so much grief? She just wasn't expecting to, that Jesus would be raised, and so she didn't notice. But it it may just be that. Uh, that Jesus is still the same Jesus, but he's, 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 he now has the resurrection body rather than our, you know, our earthly, earthly physical body. And the resurrection of Jesus, John wants us to understand, means that we can now be part of God's family. And that's captured in this beautiful statement Jesus says to Mary, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God. And your God. And do you remember how the Gospel of John began in the prologue? He said, uh, He came to his own, his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Right? And so, as the resurrected Jesus, as the work on the cross is finished and uh, he's raised from the dead. 
he said, I'm, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to your, my father and your father. God, you can now call God your own father because of the death and resurrection uh, of, of Jesus. And, and the final part is now the, the appearance with, with, with Thomas. And he deals with the, you know, Thomas has the doubts that, or oh, was he really alive? And Jesus shows his hands and his feet. You know, this, this, the marks are still there. The same Jesus who was crucified is bodily resurrected, right? And Thomas falls on his knees and says, my Lord and my God. It's the climax of the book. What are we meant to recognize about Jesus? He is, he is divine. The purpose statement. Uh, comes next, which we've talked about a lot here. John reminds us why he's writing. These are written that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. By believing, you may have life uh, in his name. And, and then he closes with uh, this, uh, this epilogue in, uh, in, chapter, uh, in chapter 21. And uh, the epilogue does a few things. It's kind of like all back to the beginning, right? Um, you know, they're fishing again as they were before. Um, is that a bad thing that they're fishing? You know, should they be out fishing for people? Should they be out bearing witness? But we have them back to the beginning. Uh, then we have the restoration of, of Peter. Peter, remember, denies him three times. And uh, Jesus then asks him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And, uh, and he and then he commissions him, right? Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. And we're told what Peter's future is going to be, right? Um, that he's, he's going to die, yeah? And that, uh, and that Peter is, Peter's not. I mean, that John is, John is going to have a longer life, and that seems to be explained, explained. He's not going to live forever, but he's going to outlive all the other disciples. And then the closing. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, who has written these things. We know that his testimony is true. There are many other, there were, there are also many other things that Jesus did where every one of them to be written. I suppose the whole world itself would not contain the books that would be written. And uh, there's been a few books <laughs> written about Jesus um, since, isn't it? If you, um, you go into your library, how many books is there? That's just a fraction of the books written of Jesus on the century, over the centuries. So John is just writing this small amount, but there can never be enough words to exhaust just how, how great and how glorious and how good uh, Jesus is. So that's probably a good place for us to, uh, to, to end for this evening. And... Uh, would you like to ask any questions before uh, we, we close in prayer? Sorry, Reverend Tim. Mm. I would like to ask why did Peter ask here again in verse 20, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? Uh, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said, if it's my will that he remained until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So what's going on here? It's a flashback, right? So uh, in a sense, John is actually identifying himself by this episode, right? Um, we're told that the disciple whom Jesus loved was the one who leaned back against him during the supper, right? So that is, he's one of the 12, and he's clearly right next to Jesus. So, you know, who, who's going to be sitting right next to Jesus at Lord's Supper? And it's not Peter, then surely it's, it's John, right? Um, and, but we're given an extra detail here. So not only... Um, does he ask about who's going to betray him, but what's going to happen to John, you know? Um, and, and there's a slight clarification here. So he's saying it's, it says, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. 
saying among the brothers that this disciple was not yet to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him he wasn't going to die. But if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So I guess uh, John is trying to, you know, as he closes off his gospel, he's trying to suppress this uh, <laughs> or correct this uh, rumour that has obviously been circling, circling about that the Apostle John was not going to die. Right? Um, because all the other apostles, um, we believe, you know, uh, were, were, you know, martyred in various ways. But John seemed to live the longest. That's why I said his, his gospel is written last. He writes Revelation, the last book of the New Testament and so on. He seems to live to a long age, uh, a, a, an old age. And so he's, he's trying to correct the rumor here. Yeah, so I, I think that's what's going on. I, I don't know. Do you want to ask any more? So obviously by this point, Jesus has already been betrayed. So he's not asking, you know, you're going to be betrayed again. It's, it's, a, it's, a, flash, it's a flashback to the Lord's Supper. Okay, let me say the closing prayer. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this uh, glorious gospel of John. Thank you that we can see in it so clearly um, who you are, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, but one God. Thank you for the amazing insight that you give us in, through this gospel of how you relate to one another as the three persons. And Lord, we thank you that we can participate in the life of the Trinity, as you come uh, and dwell in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus that's made all of this possible, that your spirit might be poured out into our hearts. And so, Lord, we do pray that um, your spirit would continue to work in us, deepening our knowledge of who Jesus is, uniting us with one another as believers, helping us to truly love one another sacrificially as, as Jesus has, has loved us. And we pray that uh, by your spirit, you'd help us to perceive the glory of Jesus made manifest through the cross so that we would always be people who hold the cross at the center. We lift high the cross and celebrate the death of Jesus for us. Uh, so we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.